everyone. My name is Marion Leon, and I'm the Director of Programs for the Anthroposophical Society in America. And on behalf of the leadership team of AUSNA and the Anthroposophical Society, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's presentation. Our speaker today is Torin Finzer. Torin is the Chair of the Education Department at Antioch University, New England. And he's a founding member of the Center for Anthroposophy, which is located in Wilton, New Hampshire. Torn has been an educator for over 30 years, and he's a popular speaker both in the United States and internationally. He's an author of nine books on Waldorf education, and his most recent books, um, A Second Classroom, which you can see on your screen, and uh, guided self-study will be the focus of our presentation today. Torin, welcome, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say about the human encounter, parent-teacher relationships in a Waldorf school. Thank you, Marian, and my thanks to the Association of Waldorf Schools and the Anthroposophical Society for providing this opportunity. I've been looking forward to it for some time, and I hope that uh, our friends in both the schools and in the society membership and beyond will have an opportunity to listen in at some point, as this will also be recorded, and that this can promote uh, more dialogue, more conversation uh, among parents, teachers, and those who really care about the future of our children. I would like to say a few words about the structure of this event before launching in. We'll take uh, 25 minutes or so in terms of overall presentation and then take up questions uh, arising from the periphery, from individuals uh, who have written in or have shared questions in the past. And uh, I would like to begin with sort of an overview, an overview that may strike some as being a bit unusual in that I'm not going to go straight to concrete issues such as PTO and uh, parent-teacher conferences and the nitty-gritty of everyday life. Uh, we can get to some of those in, in the questions, but I'm going to begin instead with what I like to see are the larger archetypes, some of the larger pictures that stand behind our work, not only as parents and teachers, but also as, as human beings living in 2015 and trying ever so hard to try and get along and, and work with one another in a world that is increasingly challenging us, particularly in the realm of human relationships and in terms of uh, world uh, politics and uh, all the social issues that we face today. So I feel it's important to start with the larger pictures because each one of us really has uh, an array of choices every day in how we deal with life. Uh, we can uh, focus on what I call the small self issues. Uh, those are the things that, such as, oh dear, I went out for a coffee and now there's a long line and I'm frustrated as hell because I was supposed to be at a meeting five minutes ago. I think we've all been in that place, and we are every day. I think what is so important, though, is that we also have moments, and hopefully this recording and this broadcast will be one of them, in which there are opportunities to rise to the higher self, uh, a place uh, in which one is able to access some of the sources that stand behind our work, one of which, of course, is anthroposophy. I would like to uh, maintain that uh, unless we refocus on the source of our inner radiance and the sunlight, it's, it's very easy to let the shadows of life creep in and really consume our inner life. So let me begin with one of my favorite uh, poems by Hafiz, and it's very simple, but it speaks to this uh, dynamic of the shadow or the inner brilliance that I hope will set us off uh, on the right note uh, with this event together. It's called My Brilliant Image. One day the sun admitted, I am just a shadow. 
I wish I could show you the infinite incandescence that has cast my brilliant image. I wish I could show you when you are lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. So in many ways, that goes really to the essence of parent-teacher relations, the human encounter. Can we see the inner radiance, the light that shines within each human being, despite all the shadows dancing around the edges? So now let's move to a few images in what I call social architecture, the, uh, the larger archetypes that work within uh, our, our realm in Waldorf schools, and <clears throat> I would maintain most organizations and groups we find ourselves in. <clears throat> I would like to begin with an image from the past. The past meaning hundreds and hundreds of years ago, on a northern island in the Baltic, on the promontory looking out over the ocean, there stand the ruins of a castle called Hummer's Hus. I have visited this castle many times, mostly have entered in through their crumbling walls and walked around inside the chambers and uh, felt the air and the sun and experienced the protection still of those surrounding walls. I'd been inside many times. But a couple of years ago, just at the time when I was preparing to write a second classroom, the, the book you saw on the screen a moment ago, I had the wonderful opportunity to approach the castle from the ocean in a small boat. And as we came up to the rocky cliffs, I looked up at those stone walls and I had a very different experience, the experience coming from without. It was quite intimidating, in fact. Uh, those walls looked insurmountable. I would not want to have been someone trying to enter from the seacoast. And that really got me going on this dynamic of the, the inside and the outside, this old uh, picture that has been carried for so long in human circles all over the world. Some of us are on the inside, some of us are on the outside. And uh, I, I played with this a little bit, and uh, I think maybe I'll just read a few examples of my playful treatment of this, this metaphor uh, coming from page 45, 46 of a second classroom. For those living in the surrounding countryside, you're either in or out. The portacullis seems to open more readily for some than for others. For those with an errand or question, one often has to wait a while for the messenger, we now call them assistants, to return with word from on high. There is a hierarchy within the castle that is not always visible or comprehensible. There are castle intrigues that baffle and confound those outside the inner circle. I hope the listener is translating this into organizations and schools. When attacked, or even if there is a perceived attack, the gates close. Emissaries often speak a medieval tongue that is hard to understand. Those in the countryside are expected to pay regular tithes and often volunteer labor for the upkeep of the castle. In the case of Hamasus, it was cords of firewood until after years the island was completely deforested. Wandering minstrels are favored. We now call them consultants. And so on. I play with this for about a page and then get to the point which is how can we make sure that we are not simply dealing with that old dynamic of the inside and the outside, us and them, going through the gate when it's open, closing the gate when we so choose not to connect. This is an old picture of Hamas Hus and an old way of working, but it still haunts us. 
on many levels. And I think one of the aspects of our schools is we have to be sure that we maintain the pathways and the, the doors and the windows and the openings for a real uh, commerce in and out and a breathing and a connectivity. I would say, perhaps to wrap this up, this in and out is not for me as simplistic as simply the teachers, the College of Teachers, the administration within and the parents and uh, community without. I think this in and out dynamic is much more subtle. One can have it even with uh, the relationship of a College of Teachers to the larger faculty. There can be some walls of hummus hus that arise. It can be the relationship of the board uh, and parents on the board to other parents in the community. It can be the in-group of parents that socialize together and the out-group of parents that is not so connected. There are many examples of the in and out, and I think we all need to remind ourselves again and again, am I standing from a place of the inside circle, or can I also walk outside and how do I work, walk with others rather than just divide the world into us and them. So that's the first image I wanted to bring, perhaps an old image of uh, a kind of demarcation around parent-teacher relationships. So let's move to another one, moving hundreds of years further to a building that stood in Dornach uh, as the first Gertianum built in 1913, 14, 15, over several years uh, by Rudolf Steiner and many who joined him from countries all over uh, to erect this amazing wooden structure with a Norwegian tile roof and uh, stained glass windows and architectural forms that are really um, totally new for the world then and still now. But the part of this first Gertianum I would like to bring to everyone's attention is the diagram below where you see the two intersecting circles. Thanks to work of Henry Barnes, a former general secretary of the Anthroposophical Society and longtime world of teacher, there are indications of some of uh, the meanings behind these two intersecting circles. I'm just going to hint at them here today and those who are interested can go further looking at a second classroom or the resources I used for the chapter. You have the larger circle, the circle that is really open to the public. In that circle, one could say it's a matter of democracy. You walk in if you've paid your ticket uh, to hear a concert and everybody has a right to a seat. Hopefully they haven't sold more tickets than there are seats. Everyone has an equal right. Whether one is a major donor or a long-time uh, participant, a musician, or someone who's just walked off the street. Everyone has a right to a seat in that larger hall. And indeed, in the General Anthroposophical Society, uh, in terms of membership and in terms of the uh, work in many of our schools, there is an aspect that is truly open. Many of our festivals, many of our assemblies, much of what we do in Wall of Education has that open gesture, and there's a rightful place for that. Then we have the smaller circle. The smaller circle is a place where people work who have earned uh, a right to be there because of expertise, because of training, because of insight and knowledge. That smaller circle could be the place where you find the Spanish teacher or the high school biology teacher or the kindergarten teacher people who have worked in many cases for years to be able to offer something that is really special. It's also the place where you have the finance director and you have administration and others who are really working out of a model of expertise. Now the interesting part of this diagram is the place where the two circles meet. That's where it gets exciting because anyone uh, can find that third space. And I think one of the challenges and one of the opportunities for us today is to continually strive for the third space. The third space is where the Respublica, where the general 
uh, audience and those who have streamed in from outside meet those who have expertise. So to go back to the imagery of, of a concert uh, on the stage in that third space, you have a musician, as I've heard in the second Gertianum, for example, uh, playing Beethoven sonatas. That musician comes from the small circle because he or she has spent years practicing the piano. You can't play Beethoven sonatas just on a whim. It has to be earned. However, the musician in that third space is also intimately connected to the larger space because uh, the audience really matters. As someone who's given talks and lectures, uh, it's been a long time since I've performed my cello, but it's, it's a very special place to be there and interact with the audience. One can feel the audience response. In that third space, one has to be able to let go. One has to let go of all the previous experiences and live in the moment. Even if one has played Beethoven for years, that particular performance will be a new performance. And as a lecturer, I have to let go of the previous examples and experiences and be fully present. The audience also has to let go. They have more, may have walked in with preconceived notions and assumptions. Oh, there's that speaker from the United States, Torin Finzer. I know what he's like. I heard him once before, seven years ago. We carry these old images around with us. And that is one of the challenges in the parent-teacher relationship. That lecture or that performance of Beethoven sonatas may be an entirely new experience. And it will only be received as such if both parties can practice a certain letting go in order to live in the present with one another. And for me, that has a lot to do with the third space. If I see a parent in a parent-teacher conference or a teacher, rather than bring the old pictures, can we live so directly in the moment that in that parent-teacher conference, it has a feeling of the first time, the first time on October 28, 2015, a date that has never happened before, and we discover each other, as they say, out of other spiritual traditions, with a beginner's mind, with a new approach a new openness. So that is the second image I wanted to bring. Again, hopefully this larger archetype uh, has some relevance to parent-teacher work. And now we go to the third image, which in many ways is the most challenging. This one doesn't come from a second classroom. It comes from my book, Organizational Integrity. And it has a lot to do with the metamorphosis of the eye the human eye that we use to see out every day, uh, hopefully with clarity, until we go to sleep at night. And again, I would just like to share an excerpt from, uh, this is from page 127 of Organizational Integrity, as our viewers and listeners uh, contemplate these images on the, the um, screen and the script which uh, is there on the left. If you gaze at these forms for a while, you begin to understand their revealed mystery. That which is open, unformed, common, begins to change with an impulse that comes from the environment. The movement gathers momentum, and a second opening or opportunity is carved out. Finally, in the last two drawings, we see a third imagination, a cup within a cup. That which was outside is now inside. An organ has been formed. This organ, the eye, contains the light that surrounded it from the beginning. The outer light has become inner light. This organ formation through inversion is a grail process. The cup is formed to hold a drop of the divine. In this organ formation, there is a conversation between the impulse of light and matter that it's receptacle. These two converse, and the lower matter forms itself into a cup to serve the higher purpose. In the process, one becomes free, 
and the eye can now see. So what are the implications of this for organizations and schools? One can relate this process to the founding of a nonprofit or a Waldorf school. Usually there's an impulse in the community that creates a stir. People begin to talk maybe at the food co-op and an initiative is taken. Parents might gather in someone's living room to discuss a possible charter school or independent school and they work together and as they do a kind of differentiation occurs. Plans become clearer, form takes shape and eventually we hope the initiative is successful. A new entity or school finds itself in the community, something that is of the community but now also distinct from the environment. And the process continues. But what is for me so amazing about this image of the eye is that the outer light becomes the inner light. The founding impulse of a school can be carried on even into the smaller meetings of the PTO, the board, the College of Teachers. And when that light is strong, as with the Hafiz poem I brought at the beginning, then there is the possibility of great integrity, of really standing true to the mission and vision of the school. And when the light becomes weakened, and when things happen, such as teachers are hired without a wall of training, administrators are brought in who don't understand the pedagogy or don't have any background in anthroposophy, when the image and the light becomes weakened, then also the vision dims. And we have glaucoma, we have issues of nearsightedness, farsightedness, and all sorts of things that come about in our schools. And people run around like crazy trying to fix things. They hire consultants and they have long meetings. But often they forget the essential, the outer light that has become the inner light. What is our essential mission? What is our foundation upon which we work? So that is the third image I wanted to bring. The first two, Hamas Hus and the Gertianum, deal with outer space. And the third image of the eye places this in time as well. So one more aspect I'd like to bring in this opening presentation, and that has to do with our gestures. The gestures we each bring as individuals into every relationship, into every conversation. And I'm just going to hint at something here. Those who are interested can go further and look at the chapters on the heart, the liver, the lung, the kidneys, in organizational integrity, but I'd like to just mention a couple of examples to show that in addition to these larger archetypes around social architecture, we also need to attend to self-knowledge and knowing how we work as individuals and perceiving how others work around us. So by way of contrast, I'd like to mention the heart. Much could say be said about the heart and long lectures and there have been books that have been written. One can Google both in conventional medicine and elsewhere. But the heart is a very particular organ that is very much connected. It forms connection to the entire organism. If I run up a flight of stairs, immediately the activity of my feet and my legs are reflected in the beating of the heart. The whole body is connected through the heart, through circulation. The heart is an organ of warmth. Uh, if we have poor circulation and our feet or our hands are cold, we immediately feel it. And uh, the heart really wants to stay in touch. The heart wants to connect, to be with uh, the whole, to be with the entire organism. There are heart people in our schools. Often the people who come to help found a Waldorf school have a heart orientation. They are bring warmth. They're what we call social connectors, the life of a party. They love meeting people and inf infusing people with enthusiasm and inspiration. That's just an aspect of the heart. And then by way of contrast, and I'm going to skip the liver and the lungs for a moment, but go to uh, the kidneys, uh, by way of contrast, um, 
and the fourth slide has here the kidneys and it's a very different gesture and uh, these these uh, drawings done by my dear wife Karina Monk Finzer uh, bring a certain quality into the visual that I find is helpful and here with the kidneys one has a very different experience a much more individualized experience the kidney uh, takes in uh, takes in inspiration takes in fluids takes in all that uh, really moves through in the fluid organism and does a sorting out it differentiates uh, it sorts out that which can go in one direction and it be expelled and that which can actually be used and uh, the, the kidneys in our schools have this differentiating quality so a kidney person likes to organize things I'm sure we've all known people who are super organizer organizing committees organizing agendas likes to sort things out does this belong in the minutes of the meeting from last week or does this go on the bulletin board for the parents uh, where do the board minutes reside how can people see what is happening on the board these kind of questions of organization differentiation are very important in a school and it's not better or worse we have to get out of this elementary idea of good and bad and worse it's just a different gesture and in a group the heart person will want to keep things moving well let's not pin it down let's not you know decide right now let's keep it in conversation and the kidney person will want to say what are the action items who's going to do this and who's going to do that and when are we meeting next both aspects are legitimate however sometimes we have struggles with one another because we're trying to bring our own gesture and impose it on everyone else. A school cannot be an entirely a heart gesture. If it is, it will have no organization and form and uh, people will come and go very quickly. A school cannot be entirely a kidney organism, otherwise it will become hardened and perhaps colder. The lung gesture is even colder in many ways. And uh, I once uh, interviewed a teacher who said in the early days we were the school and now I work for the school those two statements signify a transition from a heart gesture to a kidney gesture the shades of the lung gesture in it as well so so we can attend to this collectively and we have on the screen the lung gesture which in many ways is the most challenging of all because you also have issues of control that come in with the lung gesture. So what I'm trying to say by way of introduction to this conversation on parents and teachers and so on is that we need to attend to our own inner gesture and be able to increase our perception of the gestures that others bring. How do we do that? I mean, it, it's one thing to listen in on a webinar. It's another thing to read a book. but how do we actually do it? And for that, I would like to wrap up with uh, a topic that I will touch upon again at the end of the questions, and that is self-development. It is ever so important for the future of our world of schools that we each take up what I call the inner life. Now, it need not be uh, on a perspective prescribed path. My path has been working with anthroposophy. What I am most, most concerned about for parents, for example, is that there's an inner liveliness, that there's an attention to the work that starts from within. And eventually, if the work of a Waldorf school is vibrant and strong, there will be many moments when parents can me the possibilities present in anthroposophy. So I have a very open gesture to parent engagement in Waldorf schools on this level. We have to have an open gesture if we want to have fully enrolled schools and really honor the human beings we're working with. To this end, just this past spring, I completed a guided self-study, which is on the screen, which has excerpts from some of Rudolf Steiner's basic books 
and some study questions that I've come up with and uh, other material that one can work with. That open gesture I have uh, contrast somewhat with my views on, on world of teachers and that is um, I would never go to a dentist who uh, walked in the room and said oh, you know I, I really enjoy being with people but I, I'm just thinking of enrolling in dental school I've never done any fillings before but I'm so glad you're here today. I don't think I would stay in that dental chair very long. Likewise I think if one calls oneself a Waldorf school that one has an obligation to make sure that the faculty and staff have a, a solid foundation on the principles, the core principles of Waldorf education and are at least striving to understand and work with the orientation that stands behind Waldorf education, the, the basis of Waldorf education in anthroposophy. So I, I think there are some professional requirements that we need to attend to in our schools. And for new teachers, uh, you know, they can also look at the guided self-study, uh, but thanks to the centers around the country, there are many opportunities now for teachers to prepare themselves uh, for the work. And again, the level of parent engagement and the professional training of teachers and staff goes again to the issue of integrity. Are we going to be just another method school, just another opportunity in the shopping mall of education where you can buy some products and try them on if you like them? Or will our education, Waldorf education, continue to grow and thrive? And I think a lot of it has to do with the roots and the foundations upon which our schools reside. And each individual parent, teacher, grandparent, and how they engage with one another. So those are some of the comments I wanted to bring by way of opening. I'm now very interested in questions uh, and uh, interests of others. And uh, we'll see where this goes. And at the end, I would like to wrap up again in a three-minute uh, mini presentation on uh, the theme of self-development. Thank you, Torin. Thank you very much. We do have some questions that have come through. And as we um, work our way through the questions, I'm going to go ahead and bring up onto the screen some of these beautiful um, images that you brought in your presentations. So what's on the screen may not always align with the topic at hand. I hope that's OK. So our first question is this. How does the biography of a school affect the parent-teacher relationship? Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, it's a nice segue from what has just uh, transpired in, in terms of the, the gestures and, and some of the other comments. Uh, just as we know in child development how remarkable a three-year-old is uh, or a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, a twelve-year-old and how, how unique each stage of development really really is in, in, in the children that we work with and care for in home and school. So also it matters ever so much at what stage school finds itself. Is it a pioneering stage in those early years where one might say the heart gesture is very strong? Or is it a school that has been around for 50, 60, 70 years? We now are very fortunate to have some Waldorf schools that have really been in existence for a long time in this country and uh, much further in, in other countries around the world. It really matters, the various stages of, of a school's biography, because uh, in uh, an, an early stage, and I'm just going to keep this in a few aspects here, in an early stage, the boundary lines are very uh, indistinct, and uh, there are very few separations between people. One might have um, a parent who is also a board member who also ends up teaching country dance in the school uh, one afternoon a week. Uh, multiple roles, multitasking, 
is characteristic of those early stages. And so the parent-teacher relationship there is, is quite amorphous. And, and one is perhaps most, mostly a friend uh, with others. And that friendship is, is warm, it's lively, and it can be lifelong. To jump forward, uh, as a school grows, not only in enrollment, but also we would expect the building becomes larger with more classrooms, maybe now one has ventured into a high school, uh, there are more people involved. And one can't just mosey around. Uh, one, you know, perhaps encounters a sign at the door that says, please check in with the office um, before visiting. We know why that sign is there. And we know now why there are procedures and processes. Uh, the question is, uh, how, how do we navigate that? Uh, necessary forms, necessary evolution. And I would like to suggest that even in a mature stage of a school's biography, it's possible for the parent-teacher relationship to exude the warmth and the joy, maybe not because you're putting up the building together, but perhaps because of your attention to the festivals, that you have parent-teacher retreats, that you have uh, cultural events, that you have opportunities to rekindle some of the pioneering spirit. So the parent-teacher relationship uh, could either just follow in lockstep the chronological biography of a school, or because we are free individuals, we can consciously infuse our work together with the best elements of each stage of a school's biography because of conscious intent. Thank you. A slightly different question. From your perspective, Torin, how can parents get the answers they need from those responsible for the school? What do you recommend? Yes, that's, that's a very important question because many parents express frustration at either not getting the answers right away or being confused. And I recommend that a schools, not just the faculty and staff, but those parents who've been around for a while, that schools really attend to what I call orientation. Uh, when new parents join, that there be a real opportunity, not just a 10-minute info session, but a real opportunity to do an outline of uh, some of the basics of how a school functions and to have questions right then and there at the very beginning. Secondly, we need to identify clear pathways for parents when they have questions. Questions around pedagogy go to the class teacher or the subject teacher concerned first. Secondly, if, if those questions are not met or if trains pass in the night, uh, the administrator or the school chair are available for those questions, et cetera, et cetera. These pathways need to be identified uh, very clearly. That's on a practical level. But on a, on a more subtle level, I have found that one of the reasons that questions are not answered is also due to the way the questions are asked. Sometimes a question is so laden with emotion or with assumption that it is very hard for the listener to weed through and really get to the core of the question. So uh, I think we can all remember examples in which something disguised as a question was really an emotional outburst or really uh, um, a value-laden uh, assumption, uh, such as, why did you not? Those kind of questions we all have become used to uh, noticing. So I think it would be very helpful if in our schools we could attend more to what I call inquiry and advocacy. What are the skills we need in asking questions and in working with answers? How can we learn to really hear what is at the root of a question? 
I have found, for example, that many times the parent question is not just about the presenting issue, but also the parent brings a real question that's rooted in their own biography and their own experiences in schools or past encounter with another teacher. And very often the teacher who is so-called in a position of answering answers out of a frame of reference based upon another parent's question or a parent's question from the last round as a class teacher. And when hears the question says, oh yes, I remember when a parent asked about reading in second grade last time around, so I'm going to give the same answer. How can we learn to really discern and really hear what lies behind the question? And for that reason, things such as you're with me in the workplace, the work of John Cunningham, some of the things we did our, at our recent AGM conference in St. Louis, these are all really vitally important to the future of our work together because it's not just a matter of the technique of navigating through a school with questions, it's again a matter of learning to work together in the human encounter. Should we do another one, Marion? Yes, I think we have time for one more question. And just in case people are not familiar with our terminology, the Anthroposophical Society has a conference every fall, which we call our annual members fall conference and members meeting, which Torn referred to. Uh, our shorthand is AGM. <clears throat> so, and people are always invited. Um, our last question, I think, for today is, why is it so hard to sustain a PTO? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've been there, done that, and I'm sure many of our listeners have as well. You know, it, it, if you have a board of trustees, uh, they tend to just continue by virtue of the bylaws and, and the very essential tasks that have been given to a board. Uh, the financial soundness of a school, uh, the um, community relations and the, the integrity of the, of the legal uh, adherence and po personnel policies and so on. There are many aspects of a board work that are just there as part of our nonprofit heritage. Likewise, in a faculty or a college of teachers, there tends to be a kind of stability. Particularly in Walter schools, teachers meet on Thursday afternoons. And I always find it a, a wonderful picture to imagine on a Thursday afternoon teachers meeting as I have sat with them in schools in Nepal and in India, in Korea, in Brazil, in Canada. Teachers are meeting together every Thursday afternoon. There's a, a holding, a form, um, a caring consciousness that exists in most successful Walter schools. However, unlike the board and the faculty, the PTO is often a question mark. It's a question mark because the parents who are active in a parent-teacher organization tend to come and go. That's partly due to the fact that children graduate and they move on. It's partly due to the phases of parent involvement in a school. One of the chapters I had the most fun writing in my book, A Second Classroom, has to do with the phases of parent involvement in a school. Parents go through phases just as children do, and one phase is engagement, and another phase is to cycle out, go into outer orbit. So parents come and go. The other part is that I find often the tasks of a PTO are not so clearly defined. The tasks are somewhat amorphous. Uh, there's also a vague feeling that a parent organization is there for the social, uh, and there's a sense of communication, but uh, what, what do we really do? So I really encourage schools to look at a parent organization with the same care and consciousness that one would look at a board or a faculty and, and really differentiate and clarify the tasks. I think it's very helpful to have a couple of parent reps from each class, and those parent reps are required to attend the PTO meeting. I think it's very helpful to structure into the meetings clear reports from the board, the faculty, the college, and some of the parent committees so that there's real substance. 
Thirdly, I recommend that there be a study so that people go away from uh, a PTO meeting with something to think about, whether it's you know a book written by an author you know or Rudolf Steiner or uh, something on um, uh, raising adolescents today. Whatever the study, the purpose is to come together a meeting of hearts and minds. And finally, I really suggest a PTO needs some concrete tasks, it needs to have some projects, even if it's as simple as uh, a work day where you're putting up a garden shed or doing something practical. We need to come down into the will, into our limbs, and if we just turn up and, and have some cookies and some juice uh, once a month, uh, you enforce that coming and going quality. So I think if the meetings are structured and if the uh, PTO is formed more consciously, perhaps those forms and those structures can continue, can endure, even as parents come and go in our schools. So going back to the, the gestures of the organs, I think the, the parent organization is more of a heart organ. And uh, when it's working well, one can feel it. One can feel the joy and the vibrancies that exists in those parent-teacher conversations, and one really has a sense that the adults in the school are modeling the social future that we want for our children. So that then brings me to wrap-up mode. May I, may I do that, Marion? Yes, absolutely. So I would like to sort of draw together some of the themes. This is coming from page 81 of the second class. And it ends with uh, a verse from Rudolf Steiner's Calendar of the Soul. I began with Hafiz and uh, the image of the sun. And I'd like to end uh, with a verse, but first a paragraph to introduce it. Parents seek renewal and strength through their association with a Waldorf of school. Some find it through the festivals, others through conversation with other parents. Some want to engage in self-development inspired by the example of some of the wonderful teachers and other parents they meet in the school. This is a most subtle aspect of school life, in that one has to leave everyone free in terms of individual spiritual life. One cannot impose on the inner sacred sanctuary that comprises the self of another human being. Thus, one has to wait for a question to arise. A discussion of a PTO and other more outer forms would not be complete without mentioning this aspect of, as well. It is part of the revealed mystery of community. People are drawn together out of a mutual desire to evolve. This is a potent force behind a school. Just as the sap rises in New Hampshire maple trees in the spring, and a sweet event for all of us, who enjoy maple syrup, so the forward-looking self-actualization force in a striving human being can become a resource for health in a school community. Our striving provides nourishment for a school. And here is the verse from Calendar of the Soul. In mystery, what I received to sheath within my memory be further meaning of my striving. In gaining strength, it shall awaken the forces of myself within, evolving, giving myself to me. Thank you all and best wishes for our Waldorf schools and our work together as parents and teachers and human beings on this earth today. Torin, thank you very much, and thanks to all of you who participated in today's presentation. And if you have any questions, please contact either Ausna or the Anthroposophical Society. Goodbye. <laughs>